Please remain standing with me for the reading of the word. This morning we're reading Ephesians 2, 11 through 22. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you are at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the word. But now Christ Jesus, who you once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but the fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple of the Lord. In him you also are built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Thanks, Linda. Last week, uh, as a church, we started a series called Sharing Jesus. Uh, and we're talking about uh, how do we talk about Jesus? And how do we invite people to know who he is, and have conversations about who he is. Uh, and last week, we were in Acts 2, the, uh, the event of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came on the church. Uh, and, and next week, we're going to be in Acts 17. So that's a long jump from Acts 2 to Acts 17. Uh, so this morning, I'm really excited because uh, we have with us Pastor Lon Snyder, uh, who has been a friend and mentor for me for over 10 years. Uh, he's the co-founder of Riverwood Chapel in Kent, where he served for 32 years as an uh, outreach pastor there. Uh, he just recently entered into retirement, and so he's just recently come out of retirement to preach this Sunday. I called him up. I was like, I know you're retired, but would you come, would you come share a word with us? Uh, but I, I, I'm really excited to have Pastor Lon share with us. Uh, he's got a deep knowledge of uh, how the church is called to be for the world, how the church is called to share Jesus, and what that looks like, uh, particularly like cross-culturally. Uh, and these kinds of things. So Pastor Lon uh, is here with his wife, Sue. They live in Brimfield. Uh, and so I'm really excited. Uh, Pastor Lon, would you come open up the word with us this morning and uh, help us understand Jesus better? Appropriate. Yep. Somehow it didn't seem appropriate to put uh, my bottle of water on the communion table. So. Well, thank you, John, very much for that and for the invite. I'm still retired, by the way. Um, not coming out of anything as far as that's concerned. It's, I'm enjoying that way too much. So it's great to see everybody this morning. Thank you for the the privilege of inviting me and John for, for giving me your pulpit this morning. Um, hey, so as we get started, I want to ask a question. Um, okay, I feel too far away. Wait a minute. You see, when you're a guest, you can get away with this kind of stuff. So. There we go. That's better. All right. Question as we get started. Who here... And this is participation, so I actually want an answer. Um, who's ever been to a church service, a worship service, maybe in a different country, maybe in America, but in a different language or a different culture? Um, okay, I know, I know many of you have been in... Oh, look at all the hands. Oh, this is going to be fun. All right. So I know uh, probably some of you in the Dominican Republic, in when, when the trips that we've taken there with Riverwood and, or other opportunities. Who else? What, what, 
speak up. Where have you been? What was it? So, all right, go ahead. Oh, Japan. Oh, fascinating. So how was it, how was it different than this? Other than the obvious, it's in Japanese. But um, I assume, was it in Japanese? Okay, yeah. Um, how was it different? Okay. Okay, so, so a lot more foreign, I guess, to the culture, right? All right, cool. Who else we got? What? Yeah, Zach? All right. So the service there in Creole, a basis of French. Um, of course, you've been to the Dominican as well. So was there a difference in style between the two? As I was getting ready this morning, my wife Sue said, oh, look at you, wearing short sleeves to preach, <laughs> you know? And I said, yeah, I couldn't quite bring myself to wear a t-shirt like John does, but you know, it's okay. Uh, that's all right. All right, let's do it. Any, anybody else? Anyway, yeah. Oh, all right. So what language is that? Is that Swazi? Is that Afrikaan? What was it? Okay. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 just the, the point of the exercise, though, is, is, is just to think through just all the different ways. I, I, I often enjoy when, when I have the opportunity of participating in worship in a different, particularly in a different language, um, but just even in a different style and, and just to see how different groups of believers, when they get together, express themselves um, differently, uh, express the truth differently. And I think in, in some respects, we, we can take for granted, uh, you know, you assume if a church is in Japan, it's in Japanese. If it's in Swaziland, it's in Swazi. Is that right? Swazi? Is that? I assume that's okay. <laughs> but, or in the Beginnikin, it's in Spanish, Haiti, Creole. We, we can kind of take that for, for granted. Even, uh, even at Riverwood, there's still a uh, the Chinese fellowship meets there. And so, you know, we're worshiping in the main worship center in English, and they've got their worship in, in Chinese. And I think we just we sort of take that for granted, that, it, that, that whatever country we're in or whatever is the, the heart language of those people, that's the language that, that we're going to worship in and the culture in. But in a sense, what I want to explore today is how we got there, um, that these churches worship in the, the cultural style and the language, um, in a sense, that is all an outworking of the theology of the, the passage out of Ephesians that Linda just read us, that the, the idea, and if, if you catch some of those words in Ephesians 2, where Paul's writing to the Ephesians and talking about, he uses language like removing the wall between Jew and Gentile, and that was both literal and metaphorical. There were, there were places where there were literal walls that separated the Jews from the Gentiles, but more so than even that, just that metaphorical, that removing the wall and, and the inclusion of, did you catch those words, how he, he referred to them, that they were once aliens, strangers, foreigners, they were excluded. But now there's a great contrast there. Now there's a creation, all of them brought together in one. Um, and, and I think it's the hinge of that is verse 18, where it says, both have access to the Father through the same Spirit. And I think for us, it, unless we focus on it, it's really hard to appreciate how radically different that was, especially for the Jews, how radically that different that was. Uh, you think they had 
literally over a thousand years of theology and tradition of separation. And now Paul's writing to the Ephesians about inclusion and being one and tearing down those walls. Well, as John said, last week you began a sermon in the sermon series out of Acts about sharing with others uh, uh, Jesus. Um, and, and John walked us through uh, the first few verses of Acts 2, talking about um, just the significance of sharing Jesus. The other thing I noticed, you know, uh, there, there seemed to be a lot about um, sharing skin care regimen too. So I don't know, uh, uh, I mean clearly there was more Jesus than skin care, that's good, but I need to explore that with John as well. Just, but, well, anyway. So, if you remember, though, he gave three Ps, an alliteration with three Ps that, that out, of, out of Acts 2. And if, and, uh, if you want to follow along, that's where we're going to start eventually. So, you can, you can start turning there to Acts 2 if you've got a Bible or a tablet or a scroll or something that you read from um, Acts 2. But if you remember, he, he talked about first the purpose. And the purpose of sharing Jesus is so that everyone has the opportunity to respond whether that's cross-cultural missions or evangelism in the neighborhood or whatever, the opportunity is to give everybody the opportunity at least to hear and understand and respond to the claims of the gospel, to hear about Jesus. So the purpose was, was that, that everybody has the opportunity to hear. And then the power, the power that works within that and is the leading of the Holy Spirit. And we see that throughout uh, throughout Acts 2 and, of course, Pentecost with the coming of the Holy Spirit and how the, the Spirit is both, I think, on both sides of the equation. It's the Spirit that leads us. It's the Spirit that empowers us. It's the Spirit that gives us the words when we talk about Jesus. But on the other hand, it's, the Spirit is also the one that's working in the lives of other people that are bringing them into Christ as well. So we see, we see the purpose that everyone may hear. We see the power that's in the Holy Spirit. And then the the, the the plan, the plan, the way that, that God has this worked out, whether that was 2,000 years ago or even today, is primarily person to person. There's all sorts of mechanisms for communicating the gospel, but the primary one that we see throughout Scripture, and I think that, that even today that God uses most often, is that person to person. So that was last week, Acts 2 and, and the, the beginning of the church in Pentecost. And as John said, coming next week, a few more, uh, in the next several weeks, you'll be in Acts 17. And Acts 17 is really a case study of the theology that we saw in Ephesians 2 put into practice. Acts 17, it starts with, John in Thess uh, it starts with Paul in Thessalonica, um, preaching in the synagogue and trying to prove that Jesus was the, the Messiah to, to the Jews. But then it ends with Paul in, in a very well-known and famous passage, Paul in Athens, and preaching to a very Gentile, a very pagan culture, and calling them to repentance and to believe in Christ as well. And so from from. Jerusalem to Thessalonica to Athens, we see, we see this gospel being spread. So the question I want to do today, answer today, is how do you get from Acts 2? How do you get from Acts 2 where you've got a, a small group of believers, uh, devout Jews, who have accepted this Jesus as the Messiah in Jerusalem? How do we get from Jerusalem to 15 chapters later Paul preaching to a pagan audience in Athens. How do we get from Jerusalem to Athens? And that's what we're going to cover this morning. Um, now, I know that's 15 chapters, so don't worry about, you know, it's like, we're, yeah, we could be here all afternoon. Now, well, we're going to go through pretty quick. Um, I had thought about asking Linda to read uh, Acts 2 to 15, but, yeah, we spared her that, but... So that's what we're going to do. We're going to walk through Acts 15 all the way to 17 just to see how do you get from a devout group of Jews believing in the Messiah to Athens and Paul preaching to a, a Gentile crowd and the, re, and the reaction and the response there. So let's start in Acts, Acts chapter 2. And when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. 
And of course, we know the story. This is the coming of the Holy Spirit. The, 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 the day of Pentecost is 50 days after the Passover, after the resurrection. So it's been 50 days. You think back, and that was what? Last Sunday was Pentecost Sunday, wasn't it? Yeah. So the timing is perfect. You think 50 days after Pentecost, and they, these are the apostles and the, and the disciples, the believers, and they're still in Jerusalem. They're all in one place together. It's been 50 days since Christ's um, crucifixion and resurrection. It's been 10 days since his ascension. And so they're all hanging out there, and you, you know the story of, of the Holy Spirit coming upon them. Now, it, it, it's not coincidental, I think, that Jerusalem is still full of people. Uh, a lot of devout Jews um, would make it their goal, at least once in their life, to spend the Passover in Jerusalem. It was something significant about spending the Passover in Jerusalem. And they'd come from all over the, that part of the world. That's why when you read through the, the list, especially in verse 9, Jews from so many different places, it's because they come in for the Passover. And if they're going to spend that much time, if they're going to get that much work to get to Jerusalem, they often stayed. It's not, you know, let's stay for six, seven more weeks, and we'll do, we'll do Pentecost as well, and then return home. So it's, it's not unusual that the city is still full of people from all over the world. And it's in that context that we see uh, the Spirit come upon these believers and, these, these, and, and they're starting to preach Jesus, but then the miracle happens with their, 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 their proclaiming Christ in the language of all these people. And of course, the other Jews that live in Jerusalem hear these Galileans preaching in this different language and they don't understand it and it, it sounds like they're drunk and Peter stands up and says, you know, nobody's drunk here and he gives this great sermon that's the rest of the chapter. Uh, but he sums it up in verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him, this Jesus, has made him Lord and Christ, the Messiah, this Jesus that you crucified. Verse 38, Peter challenges them, says, repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the Holy Spirit. So we see the, and then of course the chapter ends with literally thousands believing. Those that were that believed were added on a daily basis, and so we see, we see this this core of this early church presenting the claims of Christ and that He is the Messiah to these other devout Jews, and and the Holy Spirit coming upon them. And so that's the pattern we see: Christ preached, people believe, the Holy Spirit comes upon them. We see this pattern of preaching throughout chapters 3 and another sermon of Paul and, of Peter, I mean, and in chapter 4, Peter and Paul are arrested and, uh, you know, the, the, the leaders are trying to squelch this thing and then they're released again. And, uh, and so we see this, this going on in chapter 5. At the beginning, we have the, the Ananias and Sapphira story, but then also in chapter 5, towards the end, we see a, a, just a summary of what was happening at time. Verse 42, chapter 5, verse 42. It says, Every day in the temple and from home to home, from house to house, they, the apostles, the believers, kept on teaching and preaching. Um, some of your translations may even say proclaiming or talking about Jesus as the, the what? Christ. Oh, okay, we got two different answers. We got Christ, but Messiah. Yeah, and some of the translations say Christ, some say Messiah, some may say Christ with a footnote that's Messiah, and it's basically the same word. It just depends on, in English, Christ and Messiah are pretty much interchangeable. It just depends on, do you go back to the Greek, Christos, that is, that is the Greek for anointed one, or Jesus the Christ, the, the anointed one, or if you're coming from a Hebrew background, it's Jesus the Messiah, um, Messiah is the, the Hebrew, so pretty much... Either word in English means the same thing. It just depends on if you're going back to the Greek or you're going back to the Hebrew. But the point is they're going, from, they're going around house to house and in the temple. They're talking about Jesus, and they're teaching, they're preaching, they're proving that this Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. And all those who believed, the Holy Spirit is then coming upon them. 
So we see this early pattern of, of Jews talking to other Jews about Jesus being the Messiah and those who believe the Holy Spirit comes upon them. Things start getting more tense, of course, in chapter 7. In chapter 7, you've got is, is a long chapter of, of Stephen, of St Stephen's first, his arrest, and then his defense, and his, his ultimate martyrdom, where he, is, where he stirs up the crowd with this defense, and, and in a sense, it turns into a mob action that, that results, it ends in his death. That he's, he's, he's killed because of the things that he's saying about Jesus. And chapter 8 starts with Saul being heartily in agreement with putting him to death. But then on that day, a great persecution arose against the church in Jerusalem. And they're all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. It says, except the apostles. So the apostles are staying in Jerusalem, but all these others, they're scattering. Maybe they're, they're heading back to where they started from or whatever, but they're getting out of town. There's this persecution. I mean, now it's getting dangerous. And so they're, they're starting to scatter. But as they do, they're not forgetting the story. They're not leaving the story in Jerusalem. Uh, we pick up the story in verse 5 with a particular one of these of Philip. Philip goes down to the city of Samaria, and he begins proclaiming Christ to them. So the city of Samaria is actually, it's actually north of Jerusalem. When it says it goes down, it kind of, you know, in our vernacular, the way we would describe it, we think of going down as going south, going north as going up. But, but if you're in Jerusalem, everything's down. It doesn't matter which direction you're going, you're going down. So, so this Philip leaves Jerusalem and he goes north, he goes up to, to Samaria and he starts proclaiming Christ to them. Now, we know the Samaritans. You know the story of the, the Samaritans. They were sort of, I guess one way you could describe it is they were sort of half-Jews. And this goes hundreds of years. This goes all the way back to uh, the time when the Babylonians came in and, and, and sacked Jerusalem and Israel and carried off, carried off a lot of the Jews to an exile in Babylon. Now, they, they tended to carry off the leaders and the educated and the rich, sort of the cream of the, of the cultural crop, if you will. And they left behind a lot of others. And those others, that those Jews that they left behind, spent the next 70 years or so, they, they intermarried with the, the, the people around them and all that, so that by the time the Jews come back 70 years later, you've got this cultural divide between the Jews that had been in captivity and are now coming back into Jerusalem and what became known as the Samaritans, sort of, sort of half-Jews, if you will. It's a kind of a simplification, but it's, it's easy math. Uh, and so they still had a background in, in Judaism, but if you, if you even remember when... Um, when, when Jesus talked at the woman at the well, who is a Samaritan, there's, a, there's a, somewhat of a commonality there where they could tell similar stories. You know, your fathers say this, our fathers say that. It's a similar story, but there's a clear divide. Uh, but, but enough so that Philip can, can go to the Samaritans and again, start talking about this Jesus as Messiah. And lo and behold, what happens? Some believe Look at verse 14. Um, well, look at verse 12. When they believed uh, Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. So they're believing and they're being baptized. Um, and so verse 14. Now, the apostles, they're back in Jerusalem. Meanwhile, back in Jerusalem, they heard about these Samaritans have received the word of God. So they send Jesus, or they send Jesus, they send Peter and John out to, to investigate this. What, these Samaritans are believing and, and, and they're being baptized? Let's, let's check this out. So Peter and John go down there and they check it out. In verse 17, then they began laying hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit as well. So now, the, the, if you think of concentric circles, you know, we started with these devout Jews in, in Jerusalem and now we're kind of, we're taking a step out. Now we're in Samaria. We're still sort of in the family, but, but you know, these are the embarrassing cousins that we don't talk about a lot. And, but so we're, we're the half Jews. And so, but they're believing. They're hearing about Christ the Messiah they're believing, and, and they're, they're being uh, filled. The Holy Spirit is coming upon them as well. And so we see this heading out in concentric circles. 
chapter 9. I keep wanting to say, I think, oh, chapter 9 is a hinge passage, but then so is chapter 10 and so is chapter 11. So there's a lot of hinges in Acts. But, but obviously very significant in, in, in uh, the stories that goes on in chapter 9, of course, is Paul's conversion. You know, Paul is Saul, Paul, he's out there persecuting the church, and you know the story. He's on his way to Damascus, and he has this encounter with Jesus, and the next thing you know, he now believes, um, verse... Um, Let's look at verse 19. For several days he, this is Paul, was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying he was the Son of God. And this is confusing the Jews, of course, because Paul had a reputation for, for opposing this belief, and now he's proving it. It's verse 20. Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived in Damascus, who lived in Damascus, proving that this Jesus was the Messiah. So you now we're a little farther out. We're in Damascus, but there's a, there's a, a, a serious population of Jews there. They've got a synagogue, and Paul is meeting with them and arguing with them and teaching with them and proving that this Jesus is the Messiah. So all this Old Testament, all this preparation for the Messiah, he's proving that this was fulfilled in Jesus. And, of course, there's opposition, and he leaves. Um, but we see, again, yet another step as person to person as people are being taught and challenged that Jesus is the Messiah. They're believing, and they're being filled with the Holy Spirit. Chapter 10. See, I told you we'd go through this pretty quick. Now, there's a certain man at Caesarea named Cornelius a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort or the Italian, uh, the Italian battalion. Um, he's a devout man, one who feared God with all his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. Okay, so now we're in Caesarea. Caesarea is also in Samaria. It's a little farther north, so we're a little farther away from Jerusalem. It's a coastal city. It's on the coast of the Mediterranean, but it's Samaritan. But this time, our, our, our character, the person that we're introduced to, he's not a Jew. He's, he's, he's a Gentile. He's Italian. He's a Roman soldier of all things. Um, but he's also referred to as one who fears God. Now, that's more than just an adjective. That's a technical term. A God-fearer, some of your translations may say he was a God-fearer. A God-fearer would have been a Gentile who basically believes in Judaism, who probably follows most of the, the, the Jewish laws. He definitely he believes in the, you know, the monotheism of Judaism, and he believes in the prophets and that. Um, you know, it says that he, he prayed to God continually. He's generous to Jews. Um, but he's not a God-fearer would have been a, a Gentile that wasn't a complete or 100% convert. And the reason for that is very, very practical. It has everything to do with circumcision. If you can imagine, for an adult to come to, to convert fully and be circumcised is a pretty significant hurdle. And so there was a, there was a yeah, and we won't go any farther with there, but, uh, but you can imagine. So there's a whole category, uh, and this became a technical term, God-fearers. These people that would do everything except that. Uh, and, 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 but but they're, so they're still prepared to hear about the Messiah and so we've got this centurion, um, or the, the, the Caesarean, this Cornelius, he's there. And he gets a vision. It says in, in, in verses uh, 4 through 7, it says an angel comes to him and he says, Hey, your prayers have been answered. Send your men down to Joppa. Joppa was also a coastal city. It was just a little bit farther to the south, about a day's travel if you're walking. He says, send some of your men down to Joppa. Find this guy named Peter. Peter was now in Joppa. Bring him back and listen to what he has to say. So this is what the centurion does. An angel shows up, tells you to send for somebody. He does it. So he sends, he sends for a, a, a Peter down in Joppa. Meanwhile, in Joppa... It's about lunchtime, Peter's hungry, and it says he goes into a trance, and he sees this sheet lowered, something like a sheet, and on it are all these, these animals, 
And, and he's hungry, and he hears this voice that says, take, you know, slaughter one of these things, eat it. Here's your lunch prepared for you. The problem is, all of these, an, all of these animals would be considered unclean. To do so would be a violation of everything that Peter, that Peter had been taught as, as being a Jew. And he, and he basically says, well, I can't eat any of these things. They're unclean. And the voice says, don't call unclean what God has made clean. Now, what's interesting about these two visions aren't just not only the content, but the repetition. So we see these two visions in, in chapter 10. Uh, um, um, Cornelius gets a vision, go send for Peter. At the same time, Peter gets a vision about how God has now made all of these, these animals clean. Uh, and, and, and no sooner did that vision end than the men showed up, and so... So uh, Peter goes back with the men to see Cornelius. What's interesting, though, is these, uh, these visions, both of these visions are repeated three more times in the next couple of chapters. Um, when the messengers get to Peter, they, they, they repeat the vision that Cornelius saw. When Peter gets back to Cornelius, Cornelius tells him about the vision that he had. Later in chapter 11, when Peter goes back to Jerusalem, he tells the believers in Jerusalem about the vision that Cornelius had that took him up to Caesarea. So in a matter of a couple of chapters, we see this vision repeated, in a sense, four times. It's given once, repeated three more times. At the same time, Peter's vision is as well. It's told, the original counting is told in chapters 10. But then when Peter gets to Cornelius, he says, oh, you had a vision? So did I. And so he repeats his vision to Cornelius. When Peter goes to Jerusalem in chapter 11 and talks to the, to the believers there, he talks about this vision that he had. And again in chapters 15, we see a similar account. It, it's not quite as in detail, but we see a similar account of Peter talking about this vision that he had about God making all things clean and accepting people from any nation who come to Christ. And so in a matter of a few short chapters, we see these two visions, in a sense, eight times repeated, which I think is significant just to kind of drill it into our heads. Something's going on here. We start in Acts 2 with devout Jews in Jerusalem for the Passover and Pentecost believing that Jesus was the Messiah. And then we see that spreading to Samaritans and half-Jews that, that now they believe, oh, yeah, okay, we had some different ideas about this Messiah, but, but Jesus is the fulfillment of it. And then in chapter 10, we see that, that circle going out a little bit farther. I don't know what you would call a god fear or if he's, a, you know, the ones are half Jews, is he quarter Jew? Uh, I don't know, but it's the math. But we just, we go out a little bit farther, and we see a little bit more distant, but we see the same pattern, people talking about Jesus, people believing in Jesus, and the Holy Spirit coming upon them. Peter proclaims as such in chapter 10 in verse 1, where he, or verse uh, 34, where he says, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation, the person who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. And the word which he sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus the Christ, and then a parenthetical statement, for he is Lord. This Messiah, he is Lord. And while Peter was speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening. This is the, this is the, the, the people in the, the house of, in Caesarea with Cornelius. And all the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out upon the Gentiles also. So now they're seeing this Holy Spirit being poured out on these Gentiles, and it's amazing them because for, for all their lives, for a whole generations and generations, they've been told these people are excluded, but now they're being included. Chapter 11. Here the chronology gets a little fuzzy uh, because in chapter 19, verse 19 of chapter 11, it says, so then those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose in connection with, this, uh, with Stephen, 
So, so it's kind of alluding back to chapter 7 and 8 when Stephen was, was crucified, uh, crucified when, when Stephen was martyred. Um, and it says that, that, that because of that persecution, so this could have been happened right afterwards, maybe it's a little bit later, um, but regardless, the, the word is still spreading. Um, it says that, that some left and went to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, so there's all cities up the coast, uh, each one farther, a little bit farther away from Jerusalem, speaking to no one except Jews alone. But, verse 20, chapter 11, verse 20, there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene. I like the fact that they're not even named. They're just some men. They're, they're kind of on the fringes. We don't even know who they are. But they're, they're, they're men from Cyprus and Cyrene. Uh, Cyrene is modern-day uh, Libya. So that would have been Jews that had come from Libya, probably in town for the Passover. Um, so, so Cyrene, think of Libya in North Africa. Cyprus, Cyprus is modern-day Cyprus, it's still there. Same, same, it's your question, yeah. Same island, same country, yeah. But, so they're, they're going up to Antioch. Antioch is even farther north. Now we're not even in Samaria anymore. We're in, we're in Phoenicia. We're up in Syria. And they began preaching uh, to the Greeks. So now they're preaching to pagans, to Gentiles. And they're preaching that Jesus is what? What does your text say? What are they preaching? Jesus is the... Somebody say it. What's that? No, look at your text. Sorry, I'll, get, I'll, I'll pick on you, Kim. No, it's not. No, look. <laughs> All right, nobody's going to answer now that I pick on Yeah. Wait, who said it? Yes. Yeah, they're preaching Jesus as Lord. They're not preaching Jesus as Christ, the Messiah. They're preaching Jesus as Lord. Why the change? Why aren't they preaching to these, these Gentiles that Jesus is the Messiah? Yeah, exactly. There's no preparation. They don't have the Old Testament. If you, you know, if you start talking about, hey, Jesus is our Messiah, Jesus is the anointed one, well, what does that mean to a bunch of pagan Greeks? They have no context for, for preaching the Messiah. So they, they, they change the wording a little bit. And throughout the rest of the book, we see Jesus is now Lord. He's still Messiah. He's still Christ. But as now that we're farther away to these, to these pagans, these Gentiles that, have, that, that don't have the, the context of where to start with a Messiah, now it's Jesus. Jesus as Lord. But the process is the same. They believe. It says, verse, uh, look at verse 22. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. Okay, so we got a large number believing to the Lord. So the, the disciples, they do the same thing. They send, they send off, this time it's Barnabas. Uh, and the news about them, these pagans, these Gentiles that were coming to the Lord, reached the ears of the church in Jerusalem, so they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. And when he had come... Um, and witnessed the grace of God and rejoiced and began to encourage them all with a resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit. He leaves, he goes to Tarsus, he gets Paul, he comes back. Verse 26, when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch, and it came about that for an entire year they, Barnabas and Paul, spent, uh, met with the church and taught a considerable number, probably filling in the whole backstory of the Old Testament and how this Jesus is not just Lord of all and creator, but how he fulfilled the scriptures, the Jewish scriptures and Messiah as well. And the disciples are first called Christians at Antioch. And that's a significant as well, because up until now, they've all been just, uh, in some respects, connected to Judaism, whether they're Samaritans or a God-fearer or a devout Jew. They're all connected with Judaism and believing, so we could just call them that. We could call them, them Jews or God-fearers that believe Jesus was the Messiah. But now you've got a bunch of pagans, a bunch of Gentiles that are coming to Christ. They're receiving the Holy Spirit. What do you call them? They're not Jews. They're not becoming Jews. They're kind of skipping that part. And that's where we get the name Christian. So, this creates no small crisis in the church. 
Um, chapter, chapters 12 and 13 are a bit more backstory of what's going on in Jerusalem with Herod's death and, and uh, uh, James being martyred in that. Um, but eventually, we get to chapter 15. Chapter 15, verse 1. Some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So here are guys coming down, they're coming down, this is in Antioch now, so they're coming down from Jerusalem, they're seeing what's happening in, in Antioch, there's these people coming to Christ, they're hearing about Jesus, they're being filled with the Holy Spirit, but they're saying, yeah, but you're missing a step, you need to be circumcised, you need to live according to the law, that's how we do it, that's how it's done, and this creates no small crisis amongst the Antioch church. And so they go back to Jerusalem and they say, we've got to solve this question. Verse 4, they arrived to Jerusalem, they're received by the church and the apostles and the elders. They report all that had God had been doing in Antioch and others. There were certain ones of the sect of the Pharisees who believed and stood up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. I love this verse because, because it talks about Pharisees who believe. I mean, in the, in the Gospels, Pharisees are always the bad guys, of course. They're always the opposition. But here we are at least a couple of years later, and there's a church in Jerusalem, and some of those same Pharisees now believe. But they're saying, okay, just believing in Jesus isn't enough. They've got to become Jews. They've got to live according to this as well. And I, I have sympathy for them. I think I, I think I might have been one of them. Yeah, we're glad you're part of us. We're glad you believe. But here's what else you have to do. And what we have then in chapter 15 is really the first church council where the church gets together and says, okay, do they? And we all know the answer. The answer is they don't. Basically, they sent a letter back to Antioch and said, okay, you know, we want you to do these few things, you know, don't eat meat, sacrifice to idols, and a couple of other things. But in a sense, they freed the gospel, if you will, from the confines of a strict Judaism. And without being too trite, it has a lot to do with why, when you go to Swaziland, the language is in, uh, I didn't even, I'm sorry, yeah, in Swazi. Or you go to Japan, it's in Japan, Japanese, or Haiti, it's in a derivative of French. Or in the Dominican Republic, it's in Spanish. Or down around the corner is a, is a refugee church. I think that's Korean refugees. Uh, their services aren't in English. It freed the gospel. So, back to John's alliteration. The purpose, that everyone has the opportunity to hear and respond. The power, the power that the Holy Spirit leads and confirms the belief of Christ. The plan that's person to person. But I want to add another one. Um, and that is the, the translatability of the Scriptures. Now, I've tried to come up with a P word. Because, uh, you know, John's got all these, you know, these, these, this alliteration with P. And the best I could come up with was pliable. Um, that... that capable of being changed or adjusted to meet a particular or variable need. But I, I don't know, something about calling the gospel pliable didn't really sit real well. Um, so if you need the alliteration, think pliable. If you want to be more literal, I think translatable is a good word. Because the, thing about, the good thing about, the nice thing about the word translation is, you know, if you're listening to the gospel in Japanese, it can sound completely foreign I mean, in a sense that maybe you don't even understand. At least when I'm listening to Spanish, I can pick up a word here or there. But, but in Japanese, I, there would be no connection whatsoever. It's so literally foreign, yet the content, the meaning behind it is the same. So the fact that we can, on this day, churches all across the country, all across the world, as this day works its way across, are worshiping the same God with very similar theology, but in so vastly different ways. That's the bridge from devout Jews in Jerusalem to Athens, where pagans are hearing, and they're free to accept Christ and believe, but freed from the confines. And so, so three things, three things as we wrap up, three things I, I'd like you to take away from this other than just the fast history lesson. 
But that is an appreciation, an appreciation for the translatability of the gospel. If you go to most any synagogue anywhere in the world, if the Jews are Orthodox, that service is going to be in Hebrew. Even if it's not the native language of most, it's going to be in Hebrew. If you go to most any mosque in the world, there may be parts of the service that are in the colloquial language, but the truest language for Islam to this day is still Arabic. You go to a mosque and all the verses from the Quran that you'd see anywhere in that mosque are going to be in Arabic because those languages are still tied to the culture from which they came. In this progression that we see in these 15 chapters from 2 to 15, and especially chapter 15, Christianity, our faith, is in a sense unshackled from any one particular culture. And so the gospel is, I say pliable very, very carefully because we're not changing our theology, but we're changing, we're translating it into any culture. So I hope we can appreciate just the, 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 the translatability, both theologically and practically, of the, of, the, of the gospel that we have. The second is to celebrate the variety of churches and expressions. Now, I know in the United States, sometimes we lament that this hour on Sunday morning is the most segregated. And, and when you look at it from, a, from the point of view of there's a black church because of the racism of the white church 150-some years ago, yes, that's tragic. But the flip side of that just celebrating the fact that whether you're a Korean from Burma and you're down the street worshiping in Korean or you're Chinese in Kent this morning or us here celebrating Christ and worshiping him, we can celebrate as well just the variety. I think that just speaks of the expanse and the universality of our God. That it doesn't matter what the culture or the language is, we can worship him in that language. And then, a little more personal note, taking inventory of how we present the gospel or even how we think of what it means to be one of us in the sense of believers. Um, and what does it mean for one of them to become one of us? And, and are we putting any external factors on others, any, any external expectations that aren't part of the actual gospel? In what ways may we be like those Pharisees saying, okay, good that you believe. Now you got to do this, that, and the other thing. Um, appreciation of the translatability of the gospel, a celebration of the variety of churches and the expressions and what that says about our God and taking an inventory of ourselves about, about how we think of us and them and are there any barriers that we're placing um, as well. So, from Jerusalem to Athens. And then for the next several weeks, John will walk, walk us through that, those sermons, that sermon in um, that, that Paul gave to the, uh, to the Athenians just about what does it mean and how does that translate into reaching the neighborhood here, bringing hope for the heights here in, uh, in Goodyear Heights. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for... Um, just this truth uh, and, and the fact that um, you know, for all the variations that it creates, uh, but just that regardless of the language we do it in or the style of instruments or whatever, just that you are Lord and appreciate the worship. And we thank you for that translatability and the ability to worship, that all can worship you in their language using their, uh, using our instruments and language, and you appreciate that as well. We pray, Lord, at this time together, even as we study it and as we sing, as we, as we think of this communion table, and even how churches all over the world do this, yet do it in different ways with different elements, yet the meaning is the same. We thank you for that. And bring to our attention any ways in which uh, maybe we, as we as we, as we present these claims to others, are adding uh, layers of, of hurdles. Uh, help us break that down, even as we see in Ephesians, that the walls have been broken down, uh, and whether that's literally or metaphorically, 
so that others will hear and have a chance to respond to the gospel that we enjoy. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.